Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, geometric drawings made with a pendulum and a motivation to heal people. We'll drop in on a brand new exhibition that puts a Swiss eccentric in the spotlight. And later, portraits of pain. We'll visit an artist on the Gaza Strip who is documenting his community using the most unusual of canvases. But first... Franz Ferdinand takes us out. Showcase sits down with a few members of the band to talk about their latest album, Always Ascending. When Scottish band Franz Ferdinand released Take Me Out 15 years ago, they never imagined it would reach international acclaim and win awards. But the years that followed saw sold-out tours, festivals and other chart-topping hits like Do You Wanna? Never wants to shy away from politics, the Glasgow band released a song in 2016 called Demagogue about US President Donald Trump. Now touring Europe with their 2018 album, Friends Ferdinand say they're still no closer to warming to him. Showcase's Mari Beveridge caught up with them ahead of their gig here in Istanbul. 15 years ago, the Scottish band Franz Ferdinand came bursting onto the UK's music scene with their breakthrough song, Take Me Out. And if you don't think you know it, trust me, you do. Now they're currently touring their latest album which is called Always Ascending and they're playing this week here in Istanbul at the Zorlu Performing Arts Centre and I've been lucky enough to catch up with them ahead of the gig. Let's go. Take Me Out just turned 15 this year. Oh did it? Oh, yeah. Nice. Wow. And do you it's guys still enjoy, <laughs> do you still enjoy playing it? Yeah, it's, it's a banger. People love it. It's a great song, yeah. Do you ever get sick of people sort of like shouting the, the riff back at you? Oh, I'd be disappointed if they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the early days, did you guys find that it ever got kind of too much for you when you kind of burst onto the scene 15 years ago? Yeah, definitely. Um, none of us were ready for that or expected that. And so at first, like I remember, the, so the first time you get recognised in the street, so it's like, oh, check me out. <laughs> and then the next time, it's like, oh yeah, gosh, this is interesting. And then like after a while, it's kind of like, oh god, you know, I need to be cool and polite, but this is quite heavy, you know. Um, and so I, I remember around about Christmas 2004, going into 2005, like at the height of the craziness. I remember I needed to do my Christmas shopping. I hadn't done my Christmas shopping, and so I thought, Shh, well, I'm gonna have to go into town. I'm gonna have to go into Glasgow and do my shopping, how am I going to do that? Because it's just going to be difficult because, you know, people would have been buying that record like as presents and like, anyway, it, would have, it was weird. So I decided to go in, in disguise. So like I, no. <laughs> I had, a, had a pair of glasses with like sort of clear lenses in and like I slicked my hair back. Did you have like a prosthetic nose on or anything? Yeah, I, I didn't do that, but I just wore clothes that I wouldn't normally wear. And I went to town and just had loads of people come up to me like, Hey, you're the guy from France, why, why are you dressing like that? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I didn't know you wore specs. <laughs> like, they were so, like, it's yeah. you, you're just dressed really yeah, weird. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Can I get a photo with you? They said, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and did you ever have any like, <laughs> did you have, ever have any like moments where you sort of like had girls like fainting and stuff and you were like, this is, this is strange. I this can't is, say like, that's what happened, but. <laughs> no? <laughs> uh -uh. And, I mean, it's, it was, it's strange to go from nobody wanting to speak to you today, everybody wanting to speak to you, that was quite a, <laughs> that was quite a difficult transition. Are you trying to say that nobody wanted to speak to you before the band? Well, it was a fairly insignificant sort of guy, really, just people kind of watched. People yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, to speak to you. Yeah. Oh, but people, people that don't know you. Oh, right, I see what you mean, right, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 speaking to you, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the new album. Um, I know you've described it as like naturalistic. Did I? Yeah, you did. So you have to stand by that now. I always have to come up with some way to describe it. Well, like, how would you describe it? Album's coming out like, hey, oh, I can't think of something. 
Um, it's the thing is like when you make a record, y you make it, and you're not thinking about how to describe it. You're 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 caught in the process of yeah. making album. And I often feel that whenever I hear bands talking about their music afterwards, it's just kind of like, ah, you've had to like sort of work out how you can describe this to the world and. And it's naturalistic because that's the way you can describe most of our records, really, in the sense that we play it as a band, and it's, it's like a you know, an, an, like a natural human performance at the heart of it. But I'd say that's probably true to all of our records. And like a lot of your stuff, you've described as well as like sort of being like dance music. But the new yeah. album's got some time signatures that are sort of you know a little oh, bit right. off right. And and so would would you still describe yourself as so, oh, describe yourselves as a dance band? It, it, it's funny, like the song that's probably the most danceable of the set is Lazy Boy, uh, which is in a funny kind of like nine eight signature. Yeah. yeah. Funny time signature. Yeah, somebody described it as as be, as being like trying to dance on a boat. That's great. And I heard you guys briefly talking about Brexit earlier. And, yeah. you know, I wanted to ask you about sort of bands and politics, um, because you guys also wrote that song in, I think, 2016, Demagogue, yeah, yeah, yeah. about Trump. Have you warmed to him at all? Or <laughs> 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 Has he proved himself? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't turned it around at no, all, No, I, I, I don't. No, he's... I'm trying to think of a word that won't get beeped out on right. this program to describe. Demagogue. Ah, <laughs> oh, he's worse than that. He's, uh, yeah. And, and the worst thing about Trump is he's ubiquitous. He's everywhere. Yeah. You, you know, he's, he's a total uh, psychopathic narcissist. And because that, he just craves attention. Like, look at me, look at me. And, and it's just this annoying voice. And on social media, there's my favourite lyric from the new album is, we're starring the movie of our lives and the Academy Award for Good Times goes to you. All oh, right, Is yeah. that about social media? Uh, it, it's kind of, it, it's, it's also about the way that everybody is documenting their lives. Yeah. And, and, and like, like, so like, and, and the biggest movie that everybody's interested in is the movie of their lives, which they're filming themselves. But the, the comment about like, the Academy Award for Good Times goes to you is because well, when you get an Academy Award, when you get an Oscar, it's not for having, if it's, it's, it's for a performance. Mm -hmm. And so the good times that people are having in these movies isn't them actually having a good time. It's a performance of a good time. So if you watch people on Instagram having a great time, they're not actually having a great time. They're going through the motions. They're, perform they're making a performance of a good time. But and, you guys roll on Instagram, right? Yes, doing exactly the same thing. What's your sort of thing? relationship yeah. with it? Yeah. I, 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 I have a laugh with it, you know. Like I, you know, I don't take it very seriously and post lots of stupid stuff. And I just post cats. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you don't be popular in this city. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, as I was saying earlier, I've spoke to some, some of my Turkish colleagues about uh, Scottish phrases, and they can believe that any of these like meant anything. <laughs> I don't actually know if it's just old people in Scotland that use these phrases, All or right. if you let me know if you guys have used any of these. Like bra and so jings. <laughs> take turns yeah. explaining. Uh, okay, this one. I actually don't know which, what this one means. Up to high dough. Oh, my mum says that. Yeah. What does it mean? Yeah, just like at the end of my tether, sort of. It's got me up to high dough, <laughs> like stressed out, you know. Right, like I'm. It comes from do re mi. Oh, is that what it is? Ah, uh, okay. So high, high dough is like the top dough. Ah. Is that like, so like when your voice becomes yeah. animated? Yeah, the higher and higher it goes up to it. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah Laldi, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's Aldi, definitely that's you still. Yeah. 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 What does it mean? Uh, it means go for it. Yeah. What, what was he like? Yeah, to, uh, sort of just give it it's extra. Like, what would be the American equivalent of that? Like, uh, like give it all you've got? Give it all you've got. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. But kind of like cooler. And so edgier, okay. Um, um, this is a this is an Your interesting. Your bum's <laughs> the windy. <laughs> I mean, I've never heard. You I mean, I've never heard that, that unless somebody actually uh, was is putting their <laughs> <a> window. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and literally. So <laughs> sounds like the punchline to a Billy Conley. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently, it means like you're talking nonsense. I, I, I have heard 
I've heard people talking about it. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say it. Not like a that's real, actual Scottish Maybe person, that's like an East Coast thing. thing. Might be, might be. Yeah. Yeah. No? Maybe the same. Yeah, yeah, that's like a Stanley Baxter thing or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, I moved to Glasgow from Edinburgh when I was 10, and I remember getting kicked in at school for seeing Dinny. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. yeah. It's sort of like elocution yeah. lessons. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Dinny, oh, Dinny. Dinny. And then as I was getting kicked in, I was saying, oh, Dinny, Dinny. <laughs> <laughs> And this oh. one. Go on yourself, just go, on yourself. Go, just go for it. Yeah. yeah. Go it's on like yourself. an encouragement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on yourself. That's all of them. Are there okay. any that I've missed that you think that are Oh, yeah, ball bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's, what's that one mean? That's like a brand now, isn't it's it? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the word, he's maybe. Also, he's, yeah. also, he's also a dauber. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. That's all we have time for. Thank Thanks you. for uh, yeah. doing the game with me as yeah, well. Yeah, no, that was fun. Yeah. Cheers. And good Thanks. luck with the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And coming up later on Showcase, Art Under Siege. A Palestinian artist turns buildings destroyed by Israeli bombings into an open-air art gallery. And the healer who became a famous artist. The Serpentine gets spiritual with the UK's first solo exhibit of Emma Kunz. Can you imagine an illustration healing you of your illness? Well, in the lifetime of Emma Kunz, hundreds of geometric drawings were used to diagnose and treat her patients' physical or mental conditions. Kunz never really saw herself as an artist and, in fact, had never allowed her drawings to be exhibited. But now, London's Serpentine Gallery presents the first UK solo exhibition by the 20th century Swiss visionary healer and artist. Showcase's Miranda Atti immerses herself in a selection of rarely seen drawings. Emma Kunz began creating art in 1938, when she was already 40. In her lifetime, she would go on to create more than 400 detailed and intricate, tightly worked drawings. Her use of line, her absolute precision and colour culminates in energy that radiates off the graph paper. There are around 43 of these mandala-like geometric works on show. For Kunz, though, these weren't just art, they had a practical use too. These drawings were a vital part of her healing rituals. Kunz's drawings were born out of her practice of radiesthesia, using a pendulum to divinely diagnose and heal people. She would um, use her, her pendulum, which we know has a silver end and a jade end, and um, she would pose a question to that pendulum. These questions might have ranged from the political to the personal to um, to the philosophical. And it was through the pendulum, the movement of the pendulum, which she held above the paper, the stop starts, the energy lines, um, and kind of rapid, the rapid kind of sense of movement from the pendulum. It's from that in which she would plot the coordinates almost, the kind of the points and energy kind of points of the drawing. Kunz, who grew up in rural Switzerland, apart from being known as an extraordinary healer, also discovered another power she could harness. She's also famous for finding a type of rock called Aeon A, known for its healing qualities, which is still sold in Switzerland today. Artist Christodoulos Paniotu, who co-curated the Serpentine exhibition, ended up using this material himself as part of the show. I ended up proposing this series of benches, which have a very peculiar uh, position. Uh, in the framework of the exhibition, they are somehow interrupted before becoming sculptures. I, I, I consider them as exhibition benches. And they are made with uh, this stone that Emma Kunz uh, found uh, in Vurenlos and inscribed with specific uh, energetic power, uh, naming it uh, A on A. 
Kunz's reputation as a great artist developed posthumously. The drawing came from the pendulum, from the questions she asked, so each time it was so different, um, which I think is kind of very fascinating, especially for people who are kind of like myself, who's a curator, an art historian, who we're often kind of trained to think in a particular way that uh, there's a certain progression of development in an artist's practice or they have a particular place within a canon of art history. And of course, um, as part of the exhibition, it's our like, privilege but also responsibility in, in presenting um, Emma Kuntz as, this, as someone who is multifaceted, is a healer, a researcher, someone very connected to nature, but someone who also made these incredible drawings and we can perceive as an artist today. Looking at Kuntz's drawings now, even in 2019, they still have a mystical aura and an energy. It's easy to see why she used them in her healing process. This retrospective shows Emma Kuntz as a miraculous artist, ahead of her time, and a true visionary. Her work can be viewed at London's Serpentine Gallery until May the 19th. Miranda Atty, TRT World, London. to infinity and beyond. The catchphrase, made famous by Buzz Lightyear, says a lot about the movie franchise. When Pixar Studios released the first one in 1995, it marked a milestone in animation. The never-before-seen technique, combined with characters like Lightyear, Sheriff Woody Pride, a 50s cowboy, and Slinky Dog, created a sensation. And as showcases Ali Jan Pamir tells us, the recently released fourth installment is expected to be just as epic. There seems to be no sign of intelligent life anywhere. Hello! Disney's original Toy Story has a special place in cinema history. Due to the fact that it was the first production to be made entirely by computer animation, instead of the standard hand-drawn method, it set a new industry norm with this filmmaking style. And eventually, digital became the accepted form for cartoons. But it was not only the then-fresh computerized look of the feature that turned it into the box office gold that it is today. The story focusing on the camaraderie between its lead playthings contributed to the success of these films as well. Everyone, Bonnie made a friend in class. Oh, she's already making friends. No, no, she literally made a new friend. I want you to meet Forky. Uh, the latest edition, the fourth in the series, finds the famous toys of the franchise band together to help a new friend in their ranks come to terms with who he is, just a toy. And it looks like the on-screen friendship of the 3D figures rubbed off to the voice actors who found it hard to part ways with their allies after the movie wrapped up. You're Bonnie's toy. You are going to help create happy memories that will last for the rest of her life. Huh? What? Oh. I felt less pressure after the movie was when we finished the movie, even before people saw it. I love the movie and I love the world and the characters and I feel like the, the cast and the crew did an incredible job. So uh, I was so happy with it a month ago. And so this is icing on the cake. I just love that people are embracing it and it um, just feels great. What are you doing here? No time to explain. Come with me. We need to get back to our kid. But as actors leave the characters behind as they exit the voice recording booths, eager audiences are already lining in front of the box office to meet them in theaters. Aren't we going to Bonnie? We show up at these sessions about once every six months or eight months, and they go on for a few hours. Uh, and I didn't realize I, I had finished, but I turned over the card. I said the last last line on the microphone and they said okay that's it thanks and I said really that's it my lip began to quiver a little bit and I said oh my oh 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 my 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 and then it was done but uh, there's still an awful lot of uh, discovery to make because we we haven't seen these films and when we see them we're just as gobsmacked as anybody in the audience you know you've handled this lost toy life better than I could open your eyes Woody Toy Story is still one of the few franchises that has not been diluted through sequels. And the fans don't mind visual advancements as much as they mind the essence of its story. After all, it's about presenting positive role model characters. 
and the technology is only the medium for the message. Being this hard, Woody, somebody's whispering in your ear. Everything's gonna be okay. And here to tell us whether Toy Story 4 is a worthy addition to the saga is film critic Griffin Schiller. Griffin, good to have you with us on our show today. So some thanks critics. For, thanks for having me on. Some critics said that Toy Story 4 is the weakest link in the series. Do you agree with that? Um, well, I mean, to put it simply, I mean, everyone's going to have their own opinion on the film. But for me personally, I no, I, I, I don't. I actually find this to be one of my favorites in the series, uh, either tied for first or, or right close underneath. It. And I think um, it speaks to how relatable I think the story is and, and how needed I think the story was. Um, even even after that perfect conclusion in the uh, the the third chapter, but uh, yeah, no, I, I I think it's a great movie. It's got a lot of great comedy. It's got a lot of um, genuine heart to it. It's got a brisk pace, so it doesn't feel like you're in the theater for too long. I wonder why they needed a fourth edition to the series. I mean, why do you think it was so yeah. necessary? Yeah, I, I mean, like the way that, uh, you know, director Josh Cooley and the producers have, have kind of been throwing it around and, and having spoken to them myself, uh, their big thing is Toy Story 3 is the perfect conclusion to uh, Andy's journey with these toys. And so that is, you know, Andy saying goodbye and it's time for them to turn a new chapter. Um, and so the the idea for a fourth Toy Story actually came about when they were still wrapping up Toy Story three. So th this is something that's actually been in the de in development for quite some time, um, and so yeah, and so we get to this fourth one, and you realize it's about Woody kind of trying to find his place in life after Andy, um, in in what he's trying to do now that his purpose is fulfilled. He's trying to find new purpose in life, and I think that will be especially resonant with those who kind of have grown up with the franchise. And so that's kind of why what I appreciate most about this film and the films in general is that each installment, um, you know, if you grew up with, with the Toy Story films like myself, each installment kind of hits you at a, a certain chapter in your life. And for this film in particular, uh, it's hit me at a point in transition. And so maybe a lot of the uh, affection that I have for it comes from the personal baggage I carry in, but I, 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 I'm, I'll go out there and I'll say I'm not the only one who's going to be able to relate to a lot of the, uh, the character journeys in this film. Mm -hmm. And there are some new characters. I wonder what you think about them. Mm. Uh, I absolutely, you know, I'll, I'll go, I'll say this. I think that out of all the Toy Stories, you know, each Toy Story has kind of brought about new sets of characters when they've come out. I think this one uh, delivers the, they utilize these new, new characters the best. Uh, I, I think Key and Peele uh, playing uh, Ducky and Bunny are, are absolutely hysterical. They have several scene stealing moments. They're gonna get a lot of laughs. Uh, they, they actually probably give me some of the, the best comedic moments in the film. Uh, Duke Kaboom, Keanu Reeves, we're having a little bit of a Keanu-sance here and this just adds to it. He is so delightful. It, it, he's got a really interesting arc, but also it just, Keanu Reeves just fully commits and he gives a, brings a lot of charisma to the role. Uh, Christina Hendricks as Gabby Gabby, uh, who is sort of the antagonist in the film. I don't want to say too much without giving anything away, but she has a, a surprisingly layered and complex arc, which I very much appreciate. And that's one of the instances where they do something with the villain that we don't see a lot in, in, animated films in general. Um, and then Forky, you know, we've seen him all over the marketing and rightfully so, because I think a lot of people are going to be talking about him walking out of the film. Uh, people are going to be quoting trash. It's a, it's a catchphrase that he says, and it, it kind of alludes to, you know, you know, his, his origins a little bit. And I, I think Tony Hale just kind of braces the, the manic and overwhelmed nature of the character. And, and Forky surprisingly is someone I think a lot of people are going to emotionally resonate with, uh, just from the, the journey he goes on and, and the, the emotions he's feeling. Mm -hmm. Film critic Griffin Schiller, yeah. good to have you with us on our show today. Thanks so much for having me. That's it on this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Don't forget, you can follow our coverage of the international arts and culture scene on our YouTube channel. But before we wrap up our show, we have one more stop to make in the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian artist you're about to see uses bombed buildings as a canvas to express the anguish of his community. Until next time, thanks for watching. Bye for now.